Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, in dynamic recursion there is another topic we are taking today uh, and it is uh, going to be called as continuous dynamic recrystallization and geometric dynamic recrystallization. Okay. So, if you remember the previous two lectures were related to the discontinuous dynamic recrystallization okay. and as I told you in that, that the discontinuous dynamic recrystallization is the nucleation of a strain free grain and the growth of a strain free, strain free grain. Okay. So, when you have this kind of process it is called discontinuous dynamic recrystallization. Okay. The, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, term terms which have come in dynamic recrystallization is because people have observed some new uh, microstructural behavior okay. and from there uh, they have said that it is now a different type of recrystallization process and that is why a new name is called continuous dynamic recrystallization and another one is geometric dynamic recrystallization. Okay, so, we uh, the continuous dynamic recrystallization actually is very similar to a dynamic recovery type of process. Okay. So, in dynamic recovery also we have we have seen that the material with high staking fault energy uh, uh, are uh, predominantly they, they, they re restore their uh, uh, mechanical property through dynamic recovery. Okay. And uh, in continuous dynamic recession also high staking fault energy materials are the one which are predominantly get recrystallized through this particular process. As I told you that dynamic recovery kind of recovery is a dominant process and because of that some people also refer to it as a extended recovery process means if you uh, take recovery to a, even larger strain okay maybe it will uh, come as a uh, recrystallization process okay so just to kind of differentiate between recrystallization and recovery okay recrystallization means uh, i should have predominantly high angle grain boundary that means most of the uh, grains should be surrounded by high angle grain boundary whereas in a recovered grain okay the, there are uh, large grains and in within that you have sub grains and these sub grains are predominantly surrounded by a low angle grain boundary. Okay. So, recrystallization means I should have finer grains whereas, recovery means I can have finer sub grains. Okay. So, this kind of uh, classification should be clear in your mind. Why this kind of uh, process takes place especially in high staking fault energy material because recovery is very efficient. Okay. Now, when the recovery is very efficient means dislocation can easily recover. Okay. I cannot have a discontinuous uh, dynamic recrystallization which requires certain amount of dislocation density. Okay. So, now to uh, have a recrystallization process I, I need higher strain to exhibit recrystallized microstructure in case of continuous dynamic recrystallization. Okay. So, you can say at lower strain you will see the microstructure as a dynamically recovered microstructure, but if you go to higher strains okay, you will start seeing recrystallization uh, taking place. Now, why it was not earlier uh, kind of identified? Okay, because in our conventional thermomechanical processes for example, rolling or extrusion or forging okay, which are based on the compression cycle. Okay. In compression uh, you can always understand that there will be induced tensile stresses also. So, when you apply very large compressive strain okay, there will be large tensile strain also okay. and because of that because you have to maintain constant volume. Okay, because of that you will uh, ultimately have cracking in the material. So, material will crack if you I apply very high compressive strains. Okay. 
So, I cannot apply very high st compressive strain in normal conventional thermomechanical processing and that is why maybe people have not observed CDRX before. But when the severe plastic deformation processes come into vogue, okay, so for example, uh, you might have heard about equi-channel angular pressing ECAP or high pressure torsion HPT okay, or friction stir processing FSP. Okay, there are a large number of processes are there in this category. Uh, the strain in these cases is usually through shear process. Okay, so shear strain is imposed. Th these are not compressive strain based processes. So the deformation is through shear. Okay, and because of that, you are able to uh, impart large amount of strain during these processes and because of that you are able to see th this CDRX process in these uh, severe plastic deformation process. Okay. Another uh, area or another uh, deformation where you can see this uh, continuous dynamic recrystallization is the super plastic deformation. Okay. I uh, will tell you what do we mean by super plastic deformation in a very small uh, uh, section is there. Okay. So, uh, because in super plastic deformation also you have very high strains you can achieve. So, the CDRX processes uh, people have seen in during super plastic deformation. Now, what are the characteristics of continuous dynamic recrystallization? As we have already seen in, in discontinuous dynamic recrystallization you have uh, nucleation and growth mechanism whereas in this case of course there is no nucleation and growth uh, separate as mechanism okay but uh, in, in fact in this uh, you have progressive evolution of microstructure okay so it is a continuous kind of process where grain boundaries are converting from low angle to high angle okay so basically low angle grain boundary uh, kind of transform into high angle grain boundary okay. and there are different mechanisms people have proposed that how this can happen as a function of strain. So, as a function of strain low angle high angle boundary convert into high angle grain boundary. So, in dynamic recovery as I was telling you that you have big grains okay, and they have small sub grains. Okay. So, this I can kind of make in bold to show that these are high angle grain boundaries and within that you have sub grain boundaries and so on. Okay. Maybe not correctly drawn here. Okay. So, now these sub grain boundaries these are all low angle grain boundaries and this will uh, in the process will convert into high angle grain boundary through uh, continuous strain large amount of strain. And uh, as we have seen in dynamic recovery, stress increases with strain and at large strains a steady state stress is reached with which increases with increase in Z. Okay. So, if you see the flow stress curve in this process, okay, it will be like what you see in dynamic recovery, it will have a steady state condition okay. and with increase in Z, okay, you will have higher stresses. Okay. So, you, I can have multiple curves like this. So, in this direction your z is increasing. Okay. For example, this is what I was uh, telling you about super plasticity. Okay. So, uh, this is a very old paper in 92, uh, 1992 CDRX in super plastic aluminum, lithium, copper, magnesium and zirconium alloy. Okay. Uh, this is aluminum, lithium 8090 alloy and basically super plasticity is very high elongation more than 300 percent at low strain rate and temperature of more than 0.4 TM. So, th the conditions are typical of any recovery recrystallization process okay, high temperature. Uh, however, the strain rates are low in case of super plasticity as compared to other conventional or SPD processes. Uh, uh, however, the elongation is very high you can achieve uh, elongation of 1000 percent and even more than that. Okay, so, there in their work they showed that as a function of true strain, okay, so average misorientation, average misorientation of the whole microstructure is changing as a function of strain. Okay. So, initially the microstructure has because average misorientation is low that means it might have high angle grain boundary and low angle grain boundary, 
but if you combine all and take average of that okay it is very low less than even 5 degree that means predominantly the material has low angle grain boundaries okay so these are sub, means already sub grains are there and so on okay and as the deformation is progressing okay you can see that the slowly the average misorientation is increasing okay and reaching some steady state kind of condition at around 20 degree or so okay so average misorientation and it is not a sharp change from one average misorientation to another one but it is a gradual change in the misorientation uh, average misorientation in the microstructure with the strain and these two curves one you can see the bold one is at 10 to the power minus 3 whereas the dotted one is at 10 to the power minus 4 okay so another interesting thing is that at lower strain rate you can achieve the the kinetics of change in the microstructure is higher okay so at lower strain rate you can not exactly kinetic but at lower strain i would say that at lower strain you are able to get the uh, high angle grain boundaries more high angle grain boundaries at lower strain rate i think i have mentioned that in the slide also the earlier slide no okay anyway so uh, the strain rate the effect of a strain rate is as you go to lower strain rate at lower st value of a strain you are able to achieve very high average misorientation okay so around 17 degree or so you are able to achieve at around 0.4 strain whereas in case of higher strain rate condition uh, almost strain of 1 is required to achieve that kind of misorient average misorientation okay now how the cdrx uh, actually takes place it is gradual increase in misorientation of low angle grain boundaries okay as we have just discussed okay and uh, to kind of uh, remove all the other effects of grain boundaries and so on okay there are there is some work on the single crystal of pure aluminum was done okay and there people people have seen that okay the the microstructure initially is getting divided into sub grains okay and that is uh, slowly converting into high angle grain boundaries okay so a single crystal now is dividing into some low angle grain boundary areas okay so this dotted one is even less than 1 degree the lighter ones are 1 to 6 degree okay uh, slightly darker ones are 6 to 15 degree and very bold ones are the 15 to 30 degree okay so they are able to show that how the microstructure is evolving through deformation in a single crystal Okay, so how it takes place is that initial deformation give rise to formation of subgrains. So initial deformation when you are giving, okay, so through recovery, dynamic recovery processes, uh, the subgrains form. Okay, and these subgrains are of course uh, surrounded by low angle grain boundaries. Okay, and later these subgrain boundaries or low angle grain boundaries are uh, there. Uh, there is a progressive accumulation of dislocation in this low angle grain boundary. So, dislocation recovery is continuously going on. Okay. So, all these subgrains which are formed. Okay. So, because of the recovery process continuous recovery you are continuously deforming and there is a continuous recovery of dislocation. This low angle grain boundaries are progressively changing from uh, low angle grain boundary to high angle grain boundary okay so progressive accumulation of dislocation into lagbs low angle grain boundaries increase their misorientation and eventually high angle grain boundaries are formed okay when the misorientation angle reaches a critical value of more than 15 degree so in general around 15 degree is what we take as the demarcation between a low angle and high angle grain boundary Okay, so, the continuous recovery of this dislocation uh, changes the low angle grain boundary to high angle grain boundary. Another uh, uh, mechanism which is proposed for uh, this CDRX process okay, is through lattice rotation okay, and that is uh, actually uh, more visible in magnesium alloys or solute containing aluminum magnesium alloys. Okay. So, magnesium has a good solubility in aluminum. Okay. So, the magnesium alloys because it has a hexagonal close pack structure okay, 
and because it has HCP structure the slip system are only there are only 3 slip system ok out of which only 2 are independent ok. So, you do not uh, satisfy the Taylor criterion of uh, 5 independent slip system in HCP materials ok. So, you have less than 5 slip system in case of magnesium alloys ok and because of that you, you have predominantly dislocation only in one plane ok. Uh, because of that the when the dislocation accumulates ok uh, you can see that there are on the pre existing grain boundary ok this dislocation are uh, coming and they are accumulating and because of that you have this kind of grain rotation ok. So, there is a lattice rotation because of the very high amount of dislocation density in the vicinity of the grain boundary ok. And another uh, nice uh, micrograph is shown here also. So, this must be uh, some prior grain boundary and around that you have this small grains which have nucleated through lattice rotation ok. So, this lattice rotation give rise to this kind of dislocation at the grain boundary ok. So, this is usually you will see in magnesium alloys or aluminum magnesium alloys ok uh, when you deform to very high strains obviously. Another example is the CDRX in uh, your uh, AZ31 magnesium alloy ok. So, this is also a magnesium alloy where they have tried to show that how the uh, grain boundaries are getting converted. So, this grain boundary B here which is shown with a white color. So, white ones are the low angle grain boundary and the dark black ones are the high angle grain boundary. There is another grain boundary C ok at here ok again a low angle grain boundary. So, what they are trying to say that these small grains which have formed at the at the grain boundary is through change in the misorientation of this low angle grain boundary. So, earlier this also must have been a low angle grain boundary, but continuous deformation ok converts this now low, the low angle grain boundary into high angle grain boundary. So, if we keep deforming ok later on you will see that this B boundary here and C boundary here ok both will convert from low angle which is shown with the white color right now into a high angle grain boundary ok. And the reason for that to give this kind of argument is that if you kind of plot that how the misorientation is changing within the grain ok. So, this if you see this curve ok this is misorientation on y axis this is distance and we are starting from A here ok and going from A towards the grain boundary. So, if you see the misorientation development ok. So, in the interior of the grain up to some, some distance you will see that there is hardly any misorientation development. What does it mean that the dislocation density here is low ok, dislocation density is low here ok in the in the interior of the grain and as you are going towards the grain boundary the there is large number of dislocation density as well as there may be some sub grain boundaries are forming or very low angle grain boundary are forming ok and that is giving rise to this misorientation development uh, as you go from point A towards the grain boundary ok. So, this misorientation development is as I am telling you that it will be because of the dislocation density. So, you have high dislocation density very close to the grain boundary. So, this dislocation will now as you can see will be getting absorbed in the this low angle grain boundary of B and C ok and this will be converting into high angle grain boundary as the uh, deformation progresses ok. So, uh, another way of looking at the how the continuous dynamic recrystallization takes place in the material ok. The next uh, type of uh, dynamic recrystallization. So, we have seen till now discontinuous dynamic recrystallization, continuous dynamic recrystallization and this is another one which is called geometric dynamic recrystallization. This is mainly observed for materials with again high sticking fault energy ok. So, in fact, some 
people are categorizing GDRX also within CDRX. So, it is considered as a part of the continuous dynamic crystallization. And of course, uh, it will be also at elevated temperature at low strain rates and large strains. So, mainly all the these conditions are also you will find in CDRX. So, only the how the recrystallization process takes place or what is the mechanism that is different than the CDRX process. So, subgrains are formed as usual uh, after a critical deformation. Uh, first near original high angle grain boundaries. So, around high angle grain boundaries because that is where you have more dislocation density. So, uh, near that subgrains will form. The subgrain boundaries, the misorientation of the subgrain boundaries uh, is not usually is very small actually is not usually more than 2 degree or around 2 degree basically. And because of that you will see a very bimodal distribution of misorientation angle during GDRX. So, if I plot frequency here and misorientation or let me write misorientation here on the x axis, okay, you will see some uh, curve like this, okay, a bimodal. Okay. Uh, if it is uh, so predominantly low angle grain boundary and predominantly high angle grain boundaries only two type of uh, grain boundary misorientation will be uh, frequency will be very high and texture largely remain unchanged during gdrx process whereas in ddrx you have a, a big change in the recrystal uh, in the texture of the recrystallized microstructure now what is the mechanism so, the migration of high angle grain boundary, okay, they migrate to form serrations in the high angle grain boundary. I will show you a schematic for that. What do we mean by these serrations? The serrations are developed during hot deformation by DRV with a wavelength similar to subgrain size. So, as we have just seen that the subgrains will be forming at the vicinity of the high angle grain boundary. Okay. So, they form serrations okay, and this wavelength of the serration is uh, equal to the uh, size of the subgrains. Okay. And when you and of course, as we have already seen we have to apply very large strain. Okay. So, when it, it is kind of a flattening of the grain process. Okay. So, if you start with a equix grain okay, progressively it will become more and more flat kind of uh, grain. Okay. And uh, of course, it will have this kind of serrations uh, in the grain boundary and the wavelength will be equal to the subgrain size. So, grain thinning will take place okay, with uh, significant grain elongation okay. and when they are getting thin, okay, what will happen is that these two high angle grain boundary, okay, for let me kind of execrate it. So, basically you have wavelength. So, it, it keeps getting smaller and smaller. Okay. So, what will happen? You have a subgrain here and subgrain here and this is my high angle grain boundary. Okay. And if you keep deforming it, what will happen? This will impinge with each other okay. or also I would call it as a pinching off. Okay. You are pinching there and kind of uh, connecting these two grain boundaries. Okay. So, this serrated high angle grain boundary will be uh, there will be impingement here okay. uh, and that this will happen when you are approaching 1 to 2 subgrain size. So, this thickness of the or, or the distance between the two high angle grain boundaries equal to 1 to 2 subgrain size. Okay. That means, only maybe one subgrain will be there. Okay. So, and uh, uh, will become comparable with the grain thickness at a strain approaching 5 to 10. So, you can understand that the strain has to be very high to have this kind of recrystallization process. Okay, very high strain of 5 to 10 you have to impose to get this kind of uh, process. Okay. So, this is what is the uh, schematic uh, mechanism. Okay. You can see that there are some big grains are here. And within them there are some small subgrains are formed. Okay. As you keep deforming what will happen? This kind of serrations will 
form in the high angle grain boundary and within that you can see the in some cases one single sub grain is there in some cases there are two sub grains are there ok I say single one two and the, the, the serration the wavelength is almost equal to the sub grain size ok. So, a very interesting microstructure ok and uh, somewhere you will also see a high angle grain boundary dividing the. So, this is the original one which is which must have been there ok and below that now the you can see that what is the how the spacing between high angle grain boundary is changing. Here there may be uh, almost 10 sub grains were there now only one or two sub grain is there ok and even if you keep deforming it what will happen now this high angle grain boundaries are impinging with each other and with only one or two sub grains are there ok one here only one in some cases it will be two ok and the pinching off is taking place. So, now this will convert into uh, smaller grains with surrounded by high angle grain boundaries ok. So, the recrystallization is completed and it is a geometric process ok as you can see a very geometric process that how it is taking place that is why it is called geometric and dynamic recrystallization. You can see on this curve also as a function of strain grain thickness and sub grain size are plotted on the y axis ok. So, the sub grain size is shown here ok which remains almost constant which is what we see in case of dynamic recovery also ok and the grain thickness is changing like this continuously. So, it is very thick initially and then it is coming down and it is getting very close to the sub grain size ok and this is the point where it will start showing the that uh, the recrystallization is happening and impinge, impingement is happening or pinching off is happening and you can see the strain is almost between 3 to 4 again very high strain ok. So, when the sub grain size is equal to the spacing between the high angle grain boundary ok then you are reaching that condition of pinching off. There is another one uh, type of uh, dynamic recrystallization which is called meta dynamic recrystallization ok a very uh, interesting uh, phenomena basically it, it is not a kind of a as a typical type of dynamic recrystallization it actually happens because uh, suppose you have a, in a suppose a dynamic discontinuous dynamic recrystallization is taking place and recrystallized nucleus have already formed at the critical strain ok. So, when you have this critical nuclei which has formed after the uh, achievement of the critical strain, suppose you have stopped the straining ok, you are not deforming it anymore ok. And uh, suppose that the process is like that, that it is at of course, high temperature you are deforming, but you have deformed only up to the uh, slightly above the critical strain and then you have stopped the deformation. Okay. You will think that and if, if you see the microstructure, you will see a very nice recrystallized microstructure though you have just uh, exceeded the critical strain. So, in reality it should be only 5 to 10 percent recrystallized. What will happen that when you are taking it out and if you are not quenching the material immediately, okay, that means it is at in hot condition or if suppose it is in some furnace it is in annealing condition. So, it is in hot condition after the uh, this uh, achievement of the critical strain ok. Then this nuclei will grow without any incubation period ok and you will have a dynamic recrystallization during the deformation ok. So, sometime it actually happens to capture partial recrystallization sometime is very difficult because in some part recrystallization has happened ok in some other part where recrystallization is still not started, but during the cooling period when you are cooling the material the and because there is no incubation period that means it can almost happen instantaneously kind of ok. So, while you are cooling the material or you are bringing the temperature down ok the recrystallization will happen in the remaining unrecrystallized part also ok if, if you have reached the critical strain or exceeded the critical strain. Then it is very difficult to capture that how much is the 
amount of recrystallized after a particular strain. Okay. So, sometimes you have to be careful about this metadynamic recrystallization when you are studying any recrystallization process that it, this should not happen during the process. Okay. So, that means, the material has to be cooled down immediately okay, so that you are able to capture the, uh, the recrystallization process. Okay. So, with this uh, uh, our this part of the microstructural evolution in terms of uh, recrystallization and recovery process is complete okay. and this is one of the very important uh, part because uh, all the hot deformation processes which we do is to get some very fine grain microstructure. So, we can have better property in the um, uh, material after processing. Okay. So, with that I thank you for this particular lecture.